then Valerie, um, yes. for, for the um, eco-friendly starting boxes, um, do you think we should like make some more and drop some over, or do you think you're fine with just the ones you have, or? We, we wouldn't say no to more. Um, we've been using it as an opportunity to talk about the workshop series that we have going on right now. Um, but I can double check with Holly on that and let you know. Okay, yeah. Because like we, we have the materials to make more, but if, they, if they're like dwindling in demand, then I don't, I don't want to have you guys just have those sitting around. No, no, I, they're not sitting around, um, but I'll check with Holly and I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay, everyone, we'll, we'll be starting in three minutes. We are just doing our typical 105 thing where we wait for, um, to see if there's any last minute people that come in. Um, th thank you for coming again. And yeah, being tight. Okay, everyone, it is 1.05, so I'm going to start sharing the presentation. Um, make sure that... Okay. So, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Container Gardening Workshop. Um, I am Casey Hemmeldorf. I am um, the Girl Scout who's been running these workshops and has worked with both the Virginia Cooperative Extension Master Gardeners and with the Manassas Park City Library to help get more gardening information, gardening access, seed access out there to parts of Northern Virginia. Yeah. Valerie, if you would care to introduce yourself. 
Sure, absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Valerie. Um, I am one of the programmers here at the Manassas Park City Library. We were thrilled to partner with Casey in implementing this garden, uh, gardening workshop series and to install the uh, seed exchange library at the um, backside of our uh, building. So it's a leave a seed, take a seed kind of thing. There's instructions in the seed box as well. Um, we do also have some of the uh, container gardening starter kits that Casey had put together for us to accompany last uh, two weeks ago's workshop. Um, so we do still have some of those available that are on a first come first serve basis. Um, personally, I am an avid gardener. I've worked at the Norfolk Botanical Garden previously managing their uh, butterfly house and as a library professional, I am a member of the Council of Botanical and Horticultural Libraries. So I'm always happy to help connect people with um, any gardening resources that they're looking for. And yeah, it's it's been a huge honor to partner with the Manas Park City Library. They've been nothing but helpful and great throughout all this. I I highly encourage going to the library, just checking it out, saying hi to the staff. They're all lovely people. Um, so overview of the workshop and rules today. Um, introductions, which we just did. Oh. <laughs> um, for, forgive my little typo mistake there. Um, we are watching the container gardening's video provided by the VCE Master Gardeners. Um, it will be 43 minutes long. We will um, dive into the Q&A part of that video as well, just because there's, I, there's some information in the Q&A part that I found extremely interesting and helpful. Um, and then we're gonna do Roughly 10 minute Q&A, closing, last remarks. Um, yeah, rules and discretions. Um, please keep muted during the video and put your questions in the chat. Um, no no spamming the chat. Um, we, we will see a question. We will answer it either um, once the video ends or maybe the video will answer it itself itself um yeah uh, sessions will be Hi, Casey, did we lose you? All right, if you guys didn't see it in the chat, um, Casey just said that her microphone disconnected. So she just needs a minute to get back on. Um, so we really appreciate your guys' patience as we work through some of the technical difficulties we've been experiencing. But, as Casey was saying, um, we were going through the um, kind of guidelines that go along with today's uh, today's video as they go with all of them, um, to keep muted during the videos, um, to not spam the chat. However, if you are, um, oh, thank you, uh, Nicole. 
Um, but if you do have any questions that pop up during the video or anytime, feel free to pop them into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on it as we go through. Um, and if I can't answer it, we'll address it at the end. Um, we are recording the workshop sessions to uh, post onto YouTube um, and to upload to the Manassas Park City Libraries webpage. Um, so if you are uncomfortable with that or anything like that, there are a couple of options. You can always um, like change your name um, that's listed if you don't want your full name listed or if maybe you want to turn your camera off or upload like a background image, those are all options as well. But if that's still um, something you're uncomfortable with, um, you're happy, uh, you're welcome to view these sessions after they've been posted onto YouTube. Um, and we're happy to, to work around that if we can, but just so that we can, um, expand the reach of our gardening workshop series. How are you doing, Casey? It looks like she's still muted. Okay. All right, so let's see. Okay, it looks like she's back. Okay, can you guys hear me? We can, yes. Okay, ter terribly sorry for that, guys. Um, I don't know why, but my video and microphone decided to cut out. Um, I'm using a spare microphone I have on hand, so sorry if it sounds a little more awkward than it usually does. Um, but these things right. tech, with these things, tech problems always happen. So. <laughs> Well, um, while you were reconnecting, I finished going through the rules and discretions uh, for today's workshop, um, and we were ready to move on to the next slide, if you want. There we go. Okay. Give me a second to make sure I'm sharing so this So we out. finished um, the rules and discretions. Everybody. And as Nancy said, happy spring. Um, it didn't really feel like it this morning. Okay, can but, you guys uh, hear it? Our containers are yes. waiting for us. They're uh, out in, mine are out in my shed. They're going to be out in the garden pretty soon. In fact, we already got uh, some, you can see behind me, some uh, ranunculus, which I had to pull in last night because of the rather cold weather that we had. Um, up, up on the screen, and, and had just flashed through a couple of, of other uh, images are some of my more bizarre uh, containers that I have in my yard. Um, I am a container fanatic. I uh, have usually 65 to maybe 80 containers in my yard at any time during the course of the year, from vegetables to flowers to uh, just about anything that you can put in a container I have had. And as you can see here, there are uh, uh, strawberries in a gutter. Um, I actually built that because I had a fairly non-reputable tree person land one on my front porch. So we had a spare gutter and I like to repurpose and that's where this came from. 
From at the top, I have some of the words that I like to use to describe container gardening, creativity, repurposing, convenience, versatility. And at the bottom, this is one of my favorite sayings, but building su successful container garden is no more complicated than choosing a container, filling it with media, and planting it with plants. And it really is that easy. It, it, you have to fill in a few things. Um, so several years ago, I was reading an article about uh, container gardening, and it was about one of the local large uh, nurseries. And they were discussing how over the years in Northern Virginia, they have changed their variety of plants that they have to tailor more to container gardening because of the, the type of homes that are, are sold in our area. Um, I actually have a fairly large lot, and I still have a lot of containers just because I like it for those, those very words that are at the top of that, uh, that slide. But I mean, if you go into any of the, the anywhere, um, any place that sells plants, especially in Northern Virginia, you'll find a huge variety of plants that can easily be adapted to grow in a uh, container garden. So why do it? Well, it's practical, it's efficient growing method. It's easy to grow things in it. Um, God, show that! Um, it has flexibility. Um, it can work in almost any environment, both inside and outside the home. Um, one of my favorites is it allows for easy organic gardening. All those pests, we were just talking about this before the, the, um, this started. Uh, all the pests that I have in my garden, garden, my vegetable garden, I don't have in my, my container gardens. They're away. I start fresh every year. I start with a new container, um, you know, a, well, a cleaned new container, new soil every year. I typically don't have any of the garden pests that I have in my vegetable garden in my containers. They accommodate seasonal changes. I um, mean, right now, a lot of things can't grow out there, but some can. And you can, you can put out, um, I have ornamental cabbages in the backyard right now. Um, the lost tropical plants in a cold climate. Uh, I did a lot of growing up in Florida. I like having tropical plants outside. And I actually have some inside, which I like to take outside as well. It's perfect for con confined spaces. And screening, I actually potted up a, several shrubs when my daughter was in the townhouse here in, uh, in Northern Virginia to use a screening on her, her uh, deck from the neighbors. It's a great way to, uh, to screen out something that you don't want to see. It's fairly inexpensive, doesn't require a lot of tools, maybe a pair of gloves and some pots and soil and plants. It's not that expensive to get started in. Really, anybody can do it. My kids were very little. My wife was joking um, that uh, container gardening is my fourth child. Well, I put my children to work doing all of this very early on as well. Um, it's very HOA friendly. Um, you can get, along, get around a lot of the constraints that you have with uh, HOAs. And it allows you to express your creativity, which, uh, which is um, something that I like quite a bit. So I think I got them on the whiteboard behind me. My wife's a teacher, and this, this was her station for quite a while over the last few years. Um, the basics of container gardening, they're generally considered to be four. Um, container selection, soil mix, plant selection and care, and maintenance. Um, I also like to throw in a fifth one. Can't see you can see it on the bottom. Um, creation that, that, and that hasn't been a part of the four steps, but it is pretty crucial in, in uh, forming a, a good container. So selecting a container, almost anything that holds soil and has drain holes can be a container, and I can attest to that. I have all kinds of things in my yard that I have converted into containers. Some of which you saw earlier, and some of which I have embedded in the slides later on. Um, the most important thing, though, is the drain holes. Um, you need to have adequate drainage. I have a, a walk-up, and it's kind of wide, and I always worry about people walking into it. So I've always kept some big containers out there, and I had some red twig dogwoods. They're beautiful, year after year. And then one year, they just really looked terrible. I thought, well, maybe they just overgrown the pots, even though they're large. Maybe, um, you know, they don't get quite enough light because the pergola shades them a little bit. So I went to take them out and replant them in the yard, and the smell was terrible. Well, the drain holes in the bottom had become plugged and they were no longer draining water out. So I learned my lesson and uh, you know, moved up to, uh, to half inch holes on the bottom for the next set of plants that I put it in there and everything went well, but it is very, very important to have adequate 
drainage in your containers. If you have containers inside that you're bringing out, ones that do not have drain holes, you need to be very careful when you bring them outside so as you don't overwater them. It's often difficult to tell. The tops can dry and the bottoms can be very wet, as I can attest to. Um, you can use a tray to elevate the container um, or uh, something else. I, I have little blocks I put under my containers on my, that are on the ground just so the drain hole stays up in the air. Also, uh, you get a lot fewer bugs who make their home underneath there during the course of the year. Uh, you do have to watch out for mosquitoes when you have trays. I, I don't know about everybody who I'm online with, but I have a feeling we all battle for mosquitoes during the summertime, and uh, I don't want to give them any more homes than I already do. So if I have any containers out there that have a built-in tray or have a tray with them, I always make sure after I water to dump that water back out again. And then just showing some holes here and a hole in another container. And then this is one of my containers. This is actually an old uh, watering can, a galvanized watering can. And there are holes drilled in the bottom. You can see the plant that I put in it actually grew too big since you can't see the watering can anymore. Um, but it, it's you can make anything into a, into a container as long as you put some holes in it. So selecting. Well, there's such a variety to select from nowadays. And what should you consider when doing it? Porosity, cost, how is it going to, if you have it outside, how is it going to last? I have about oh, 12, 15 um, containers I keep outside all year long, very large trees and other things. Um, location where it's going to be and the weight of it. So there's really kind of three different types. You know, we have the, the um, terracotta, I love terracotta, but it tends to dry out. I have found succulents, which I have a little section on later, do great in terracotta. I like it for that. And if I have terracotta pots and, and I want to retain the moisture a little bit more, I'll actually take old bags or grocery bags that I have I, I have um, you know, from shopping. I try not to get many, but you do sometimes. Cut the bottom out of it and put it inside, and that acts as a barrier as well. Um, they, they're, they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, they, they retain heat. But they're hard to keep out in the wintertime because they do chip. Um, they tend to absorb moisture and with the freezing thaws, they can literally fall apart. But my favorite are glazed pots. I have a big one here. There's my glazed pot. I have a lot of these. Um, I do put them away for the wintertime for the most part. Um, they, retain, they retain water well because they're glazed. You don't get a lot of moisture coming through the, the uh, wall of the container. Um, they do can be prone to freeze or chip, especially if they get a little chip, then they're sent, they can get exposed to the, to the same problems that you have with, with terracotta. They are a little more expensive, and mine tend to last for a very long, long time, which is another uh, advantage of them. Um, plastic pots, I love. Um, here's one right here, of course. Everybody's seen them. Uh, they're great. They retain water well. They're inexpensive. I mean, this one can look a little cheap if you've got some pretty area you, you want to put a pot in. Um, the plastic pots now, though, they, they come in such a variety of, of colors and sizes and uh, textures now that it's really amazing. And it's, a, it's a, nice, um, a nice way to get involved in container gardening without having to spend a lot of money. And if you're kind of a, if you're like me, uh, you, you see things and want to duplicate them. This was one of mine. Uh, I decided, I saw in a magazine where they had made their own containers, their own concrete containers. So I built a mold and I made two of these things. And there's two things I can tell you about those containers. Number one is that they're never going to be moved from where they are because they weigh several hundred pounds. And number two, they will outlast me. These things will be around forever. People will be talking about those, those uh, concrete containers that are stuck in two locations in my yard um, for quite a while. Um, the one thing to consider, in my mind, quite a bit with containers is that to remember the size of the pot. I've had so many pots blow over on my deck. I and mean, we get kind of windy here, and uh, I, I've just had so many. And that little tree on the right, eventually they grow into something like on the left. So do be aware that these things grow quite a bit when you, when you go to select your container. Choose one that's going to be the right size for the mature you know, not just for when you, when you start. Um, Self-watering containers, I don't know why I kept this in here, but I did. I just like it because, man, they're so ingenious. And this one, 
this is a little wick on the bottom, which wicks up and in. I'm not quite sure how well some of these work, but I don't know about everybody. You go away for days or several days. You've got to find somebody to water your containers. It's a little harder for me with 65 or 70 containers to water, but it'd be nice if everything was self-watering. They aren't, but uh, uh, that, that's another option that you can have. And it looks like it's a lot of fun to try to build some on your own. And non-traditional containers, by far my favorite. Um, I have a, one of the slides, original slides, had a uh, fire pit that had uh, kind of disintegrated. I put holes in that, made that into a small uh, container garden. Um, gutters, uh, I've got galvanized pails and buckets and so forth. Um, other things like salad tables are great ways to grow containers. This, you can either build your own. Uh, I think this was a commercial one that I just pulled off the web. And this is actually one that I built myself um, just out of repurposed wood. It's just got um, two by four fencing um, underneath it to hold everything up. And these containers actually have become some of my favorites in the garden as well. Just like a little felt container um, with handles. They're easy to move around. Um, I, they overwinter well. And I've got parsley, cilantro, another great thing to grow in a container. I grow cilantro all year long. When it starts getting tall, I put more seeds in there and just have a continuous batch coming up. Also growing microgreens in here. You can see the two, one of them I just seeded. And the other one has the microgreens um, that are ready to pick. And then another one of my favorite stories are my carrots. I've always had trouble with carrots in the garden. Um, they, they are, my ground seems to harden up just at the time that they're really starting to grow. I haven't had the best of batches. And I had two uh, garbage cans left over. I mean, we have chickens. And I had the feed in those, and uh, some rodents chewed through the tops. So I was left with two really nice garbage cans, nothing to do with them without the tops. So I made them into containers, as you can see here. And see how well the carrots do in them. We, we grow all types of different color carrots and um, grow them in there every year. And I've had great crops out of them. And you can see I also elevated it off the ground. I built a little rack so that it wasn't sitting on the ground so that the water would flow through and not get stopped by the earth below it. All right, number two, soil mixes. Um, in general, garden soil or bought garden soils are not good to use in containers because we need air in there and they tend to compact. So all of the soilless mixes that are out there are designed to allow your container to have, uh, be able to breathe. It's to put a room inside of there. Um, unfortunately, peat is the most uh, the most common uh, additive to to um, to any kind of mix. Um, it is not renewable. It is listed as organic, but it is not renewable. And uh, nowadays, you can find other mixes with compost, composted pine bark, coir. Um, there's other alternatives, and some of the alternatives will have more of these and less of the peat. Um, I do try to use ones that have less peat in them if I can't find ones that aren't peat free completely. Um, some of them have sand to add weight. Um, I've added sand to some of my succulents and so forth. Perlite, vermiculite, two minerals which are used to retain water and promote drainage. And if you're ambitious, there's so many sites out there that will tell you how you can make your own. You know, from coir, compost, um, composted bark, um, you can add clay and other things to it to make it more top heavy or, or, or more, more stable for, for uh, large plants. I have several trees outside. And a lot of times everyone wants to use compost. And compost is great, but sometimes doesn't tend to have quite the drainage that you might want. So uh, from what I have read, a lot, of the, a lot of people recommend using a 50-50 compost and soilless mix. The advantage of compost is, however, that it does have some major and minor nutrients that, that your plants do need. And the reason you need that is that soilless mixes are just that. They aren't soil. There's, in general, not a lot in them that is going to help your plant grow. Now, a lot of soil mixes will have fertilizers in them. So you need to read the bag fairly carefully when you start to see if it is. And if not, add fertilizers. Um, you're going to need to fertilize your plant if you want it to be big and healthy. Um, I have a lot of plants that I overwinter outside. Um, unfortunately, they've probably been gotten very compact over the years, um, but they need fertilizer of some type. I have 
I actually like the, the slow release with those. The plants are very big, um, but slow release or liquid, um, either one. Um, another thing to remember also is that for those who want to be organic, um, as we were just talking about, um, it, it doesn't mean renewable. Um, in general, we, we like to promote things that are renewable, um, such as, you know, coir, which is the, the husks from, from coconuts and so forth, composted pine bark. Um, I have several examples here. We tried this yesterday. I'm not quite sure how well you can see them, but this is an organic potting mix. You can see how, how porous it is, though, compared to, like, garden soil. They're very, very porous. That one has composted forest products, coir, poultry litter, and peat. Unfortunately, a lot of them have peat, although you can see that there's a lot less in this, this container. Um, I have several other ones here. Um, processed forest product, peat, coir. Um, uh, this one has perlite, so you can actually you can see the difference between those two. Um, in that uh, the, the, the white little pieces in there are the perlite. And this one happens to have fertilizer. The other one has some fertilizer too in the poultry litter. So as I said, you need to carefully read the instructions on these before you, uh, you know, before you add any, any fertilizers to them. Um, the, the great thing about, um, oh, getting ahead of myself. Um, you can use a little soilless mist. I added this, this bullet because a lot of, this was probably the most common question that I got was, can I use my old stuff? Well, the great thing about the using new soilless mix is that it drains really well. It's not compacted and there are no diseases or anything else in it at the time. When you use old mix, it has become compacted over time and lost some of that ability to drain. And it also um, could contain any diseases that it might have picked up. Um, if you're going to use the same, um, again, I've seen recommendations of using like a 50-50 mix. Um, there are some special mixes for plants. I actually put a few slides in at the end here on succulents. They've become one of my favorite for outdoors for a number of reasons, which I'll go through then. But they, they tend to have um, improved uh, drainage properties for a lot of those things, like succulents, which you don't want to have um, sitting inside a, you know, a wet environment. They, they like it dry. All right. Um, I talk rather fast. I hope I'm not talking too fast. Uh, number three, plant selection. Anybody who's seen anything that a master gardener has ever done has seen this over and over. Right plant, right place. And it is so true. And it's very true with container gardening. But the advantage, I think, that you have with container gardening is that you can actually find the right place if you don't have it there originally. We're mobile. Um, there's so many plant choices. Um, in general, grouping plants with a similar growing characteristic, you're going to put them together. You want to put things that are there for the shade with something that goes with the sun, vice versa. You want, if you're going to group plants in a container, you want to keep them fairly the same. Um, you want to locate them, of course, where they thrive, which we were just talking about, right plant, right place. Put them someplace where that plant has the, the best opportunity to be as healthy as it can be. Um, consider the mature size. Again, I put that in there because I've made this mistake. I love zinnias. I'll grow them in pots. They tip over. Not big enough pot. Um, again, consider the mature size. Um, light and water requirements for, for different things. You know, of course, something you have to consider. Future location of, of the pot. If you're so inclined to make a concrete pot, you got to remember it's going to stay there. I have another very large tree in a pot. The pot diameter is about, about three feet. And uh, of course, that's never going to move. It was planted there, it stays there, and it doesn't go anyplace. Um, I do overwinter a lot outside. And the general rule of thumb is that it should be two hardiness zones less than what you have. Um, I have um, several plants outside. They're all at least zone nine in hardiness or less to make sure that they survive our, our winters. Um, even that said, I've had some plants have some issues uh, because the base gets so warm early. I've had some plants wreath out and then had us get hit with freezes. And I've actually lost a few of my trees that way, um, unfortunately. And the other great thing about plant selection is you can change it with the seasons. You can change all year long. I love planting perennials. 
um, perennials tend to have a shorter uh, bloom time. Once they're done blooming, I'll either leave them in a pot or if I think I can put them in then it's not too hot, I transplant them right to my garden. So a lot of my perennials in my garden actually started off as pots and things that I had places for already uh, to go off in, in my already crowded garden. Uh, vegetables. I love growing vegetables. Um, excuse me. The, the picture on the left, it's a little faded because I'm going to be putting uh, verbiage over the top of it. I actually made up for my son-in-law last year. He loves to grill. And it doesn't follow all the principles. And then you can see the basil in there with sage and, and oregano and other things that probably like it a little drier. Um, but the idea was, was to build something for him. It's actually fairly large that can go right next to his grill and he can just pull the fresh, fresh herbs off of. And it turned out really nice. And actually they showed it to me when we were down there a couple of weeks ago. And the oregano and the sage and the thyme and the, the rosemary have overwintered well. They just pulled it up next to their house. Um, for those who like to garden organically, um, you have fewer pests and diseases overall, which is fantastic. Um, there's a lot of varietals, but you should probably tend to keep ones that are um, tend to be miniature or bush size. Uh, that way they won't overgrow the container. You um, indeterminate, indeterminate tomatoes, which I love. I have cages that are five feet tall, six feet tall to hold these things because they keep growing. Harder to grow in a pot. However, um, smaller potato, uh, uh, patio varieties do great. Beans, carrots, Swiss chard, um, cucumbers, if you have a trellis nearby, um, eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, they're all really, really good, um, good choices. Um, again, herbs, I put here group like together. Um, sometimes I don't always do it, uh, but um, it's a good general requirement. The good thing about this pot right here was even though that there are plants that like it a little drier and a little wetter, they're all absolutely full sun herbs. Um, you want to plant it at the same time as you would plant your garden, you know, which makes sense. Um, the, the advantage is though, is if you plant a little early and we do get a frost, you can pick up the pot and move it into a warmer location um, for that evening. Uh, most require at least six hours of sunshine. Uh, direct sun, actually. So most vegetables like to have sun, and most of them do better with the more sun that they get. So um, it, it is important if you're going to grow vegetables that you have a sunny place somewhere which you can put them in. Uh, the great thing about uh, the internet and the world today is there is so much information information right at your fingertips. Um, this is the uh, a site, a PDF, um, and actually it's it comes from this one, which is one of my favorite sites, um, Vegetable Gardening in Containers. You can just type Vegetable Gardening in Containers plus VCE and it will come right up. Or here's the link down here. And this one tells, you know, what, what size of the container to use, distance between plants, um, days to harvest. Uh, my son moved to California last year and he just got an apartment that has a big balcony. And I actually forwarded this, this link out to him for him to use. Um, because he's, he's actually vegan and he would like to, to grow a lot of things himself to pick off of. And this is probably one of my absolute favorite um, diagrams. Um, it, it tells planting times. And again, this is another one that can be easily found and there's the link to it right there. Um, as you can see where we are on the, the 20th or so, and this one's for Northern Virginia or their last killing frost is, is right at the end of the month of uh, April. And what you should have or be starting out in the gardens. Um, I actually have uh, peas in right now and onions in my garden, radishes. Um, I do all my radishes in pots. Um, I really like them in the pots, uh, except for daikons. I do daikons in the garden, they grow too deep. But the, the smaller uh, red type radishes, I grow a lot of those in pots. Spinach, um, turnips. I do a lot of, uh, I grow a lot of lettuce in the basement, always have some left over, and I'll make little lettuce pots for people as well. Um, all of these things grow great in, uh, in containers. Now I'm gonna pause there for a second and say that this chart I wasn't able to find online um, with the link given. Um, if you guys want to search for it, I'm sure that's out there, but I, I couldn't find it with this link. 
so I I would not give it a try. Um, and then this chart is in the seed exchange box that is at the Manassas Park City Library. So if you don't want to print this out, if you just want to quickly glance at it, um, it is on the interior door of the seed exchange box for anyone to view. Um, yeah. Give me a second. But the, the smaller uh, red type radishes, I grow a lot of those in pots. Spinach, um, turnips. I do a lot of, uh, I grow a lot of lettuce in the basement, always have some left over, and I'll make little lettuce pots for people as well. Um, all of these things grow great in, uh, in containers. Flowering plants. I love my flowering plants as well. And I have found very few things that don't like to grow in containers. I have had a couple. I actually put a hydrangea in a very large blue pot and it grew great. It was gorgeous, but it was in direct sun. And I did do some reading and they said sometimes hydrangeas don't bloom if the roots are too high. And sure enough, that hydrangea didn't bloom all year long. It looked gorgeous. I don't think it had been clipped the year before. So it, it looked great. It didn't show any signs of, of having had the, the ends cut off. Because um, most of them, tend, I think, tend to bloom on, on old wood. So you, you have to be a little careful where you might put things. But I have found very few that don't grow fairly well. Bulbs, perennials, shrubs, evergreens, trees. I have actually done them all at one point in my life. Um, I, what I like about container gardening is it allows you to think outside the box. You don't have to be confined to a small space or in my garden, which is a little more set. My flower gardens are fairly well planned. I can do anything in these, and that's probably why I have so many of them. Um, flowering plants. Um, if you want to create a nice flowering plant, uh, you know, display, I would say, um, you want to create a focal point. Um, balance asymmetric and symmetrically if you want. I like actually having asymmetric um, plants, uh, you know, settings. Um, but the typical would be like the, the thriller, filler, and spiller, where you have something tall in the center, something that fills around, and something that goes over the edges. Um, color, echoing, and harmonies, not something I've been all that great at. I've had some very odd looking combinations before. Um, don't forget about, about leaf shapes and textures. They can be a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of plants out there that don't produce flowers, but have very, very interesting leaves. And um, one of my favorite hints is to set it up at the garden center or wherever you're at. Take the plants, put them down, set them up, put on your grow glasses, imagine what they're going to look like in a, in a month or so, and, and try to visualize what it'll be when it's all put together. And that also helps a lot with the the color echoing and color harmonies. You'd think I'm colorblind, but I'm actually not with some of the colors that I've actually I've put together. And here's a really pretty one you may not think of. It's got it's got a palladium in the in the center and New Guinea impatience and then and just a variegated ivy that's flowing over the edges and you can see how well everything filled in on the, on that pot. Um, personally I do love the uh, the saying imitation is a sincere form of flattery and in this case, I actually flattered metal like botanical gardens, just an example. Um, they have beautiful setups, um, just just gorgeous uh, pots, some of them single varieties, um, others with, with uh, you know, uh, the thriller and filler and spiller type uh, combinations of, of plants in them. Um, I love going to these places and looking at what they have. And actually, this is one of my favorites, and what got me involved more in putting more succulents out in my backyard was this one display that they had um, that we saw several years ago. It was just absolutely gorgeous. Maintenance, something that we all struggle with here. Um, they want you, the general rule of thumb is to the first inch is dry, then you need to walk. Um, as you know, in Northern Virginia, we can be very hot and very dry during the summer times. This is probably my hardest one. To, uh, to maintain. I'm mean, often watering every single day and some plants like some things that might be outside in inside of um, pots that are more porous, you almost have to water more than one time a day. Um, 
fertilizer, of course, as we had talked about before, uh, you want to be able to have something in the soil that your plants can actually use to grow. And a lot of soilless mixes, if they don't have something in there, compost, fertilizer, so forth, are fairly sterile and they don't have what you want, want to, uh, to grow. So you need to add some type of time releaser with the fertilizers. Um, pruning deadhead, another great thing. I love my perennials and obviously when you prune them, they, they grow, grow a little bit more. Same with uh, annuals. Um, and be watchful for insect problems, although you don't get as many. I like to grow ornamental peppers. And sometimes I'll just grow hot peppers as ornamental peppers and we'll, we'll pick those as well. I like the look of them. And I came out one day and one of them just looked terrible. And there was a, there was a tomato hornworm on it and it had eaten a good half of the plant in one day. Um, or at least from what I had seen it. And I think I would have seen the damage as, as uh, uh, severe as it was. So you do have to be careful of these things, um, mildews and, and other things, you know, and, and adjust where your plant is. Perhaps it's not getting enough air, airflow where it is. Maybe it's in too, too much of a shade if it's too leggy. Things that you have to watch out for um, with the maintenance of your plant. Like I said, I did add a few slides here on, on succulents. Um, I love succulents. The little picture up in the top right even was from my daughter's wedding, and we actually used succulents in small pots as our table assignments. Um, I love succulents. They've become one of my favorites, um, but drainage is paramount in succulents succulents. You have to have drain holes and it's hard because a lot of my succulents I like to drag outside um, from the inside since they, they aren't winter hardy and a lot of our inside pots if they don't have trays don't have, have drain holes. So you have to be very careful with that. Um, succulents when replanting and we're going to get into creation in a second but often have very very fragile roots so you need to be quite quite um, careful when you're doing that and the roots are fairly shallow. So um, near the surface of it, pulling as much moisture as they could when it rains. So you can't plant them uh, too deep. Uh, you have to choose a pot that's appropriate size for those, not too big, unlike what we were just been talking about. Soil must be well drained, and there's a lot of commercial mixes. You know, here's one here. Another one unfortunately contains peat moss, but this one was was set up for succulents. It's a little more porous, a little. Uh, let me hold it up. A little better drain. And again, organic does not guarantee non-renewable, so uh, you should watch for that. Um, there are a lot of options for producing your own mixes. Again, the internet is full of great ideas. Make sure you get your great ideas, though, from a reputable site and uh, just maybe not some, some blog, but from Cooperative Extension or some other place that you can, you can trust. From watering succulents, um, they do need water, but they don't like to sit in water. As I said, a lot of my succulents that I take out have trays with them. You got to be careful to dump that water. I think that's the next one. Um, to dump out the water um, from the trays after you've watered them. It's very important. Succulents kind of have natural growing cycles as well, um, winter and summer. Um, so when you when I bring mine back in, I don't I don't water them quite as much as I do when they're when they're outside. Kind of let them go into some, some a little bit of a dormant stage. They're going to be dragging them in and out. Um, you want to avoid watering at frequent amounts, and that's so hard. Because when I bring them outside, they get so dry, and I'm afraid they're going to die. And I, I must admit, I often do water them every day, but um, you should always give them a good soaking. Um, after watering, remove the excess water from the drain tray. I probably should have that further up in there. And second, these will not will wilt if they don't have enough water. They, they tend to like to tell you when when they don't when they don't have enough water in them. And again, I have to show this one, this picture again, and it's just a beautiful example of what you can do with, uh, with succulents. Just a variety of colors and so forth um, that you can, you can obtain and fairly easy to take care of when they're outside. Um, I said I bring things in and out quite a bit, and this is a great rule of thumb overall. Um, you should start in a shady area before you put them out. Those of you who like to bring your containers in and out um, should do that. I have a, a calamondin. It's this little, small, fairly bitter, uh, like oranges, um, my brother had given me. And we take it in and out every year. I have it near a window downstairs. And we drag it in and out every every season. When I take it back outside, though, I put it underneath my, my pergola for a little bit, let it get dappled sunlight before I bring it out. 
or the leaves will get burned in the sunshine. Um, a lot of varieties don't handle um, direct sun well. You should do some research before you, you put things out. And again, in the same type of things that we were talking about before, there are there are pests generally with um, potted plants. You don't have as many, but mealybugs, scales, spider mites, and so forth. And I, again, I try not to use any kind of um, uh, insecticides at all. So, you know, alcohol, swabs, or insecticidal soaps are, are very good for these type of things. Um, as well, when you're bringing them back in, you want to acclimate bringing them back indoors for temperature changes. And like we were just saying, outdoor succulents might need a little bit more water than they are indoors, considering our, our uh, summer times. All right, so now number five, this is the last one on my list, uh, creation of the pots. And um, this is a very important part of making your container. Um, it is not recommended to pile a bunch of rocks in the bottom and then put your soil on top. It's just a breed, breeding ground for everything that you don't want. But the drainage holes do need to be covered in some way. I'll often take just a small stone and put it over the holes. That's enough to allow good drainage, but not allow everything to seep out. I did have a problem with that, though, is I used some pebbles that were very round. And if I was watering this plant and it never drained, turned it over and that small stone acted as a perfect stopper on the one hole that was in there. So you have to be careful with that. Um, sometimes you use, use um, some type of a screening at the bottom just to keep the, uh, the water from coming out. Um, those containers that I showed you earlier that I put uh, carrots in, the carrots don't need you know, that, that much space. So I actually have used filler in there. But I will cover the filler with a, um, so some type of a uh, landscape fabric. And that keeps the soil from getting down into the material down below. You want to fill it to, to near the potting depth. As you know, you're going to be adding volume to it with your plants. So you don't want to fill it all the way to the top. And then arrange it to, to, to your taste. Um, you follow the basics that we had gone through in making it. Try to picture what it will look like a month down the road. Um, then you can remove the plants from their containers, and oftentimes when you buy plants, uh, you'll see that they're very root bound. You want to loosen those up a little bit, except for succulents. Fill in the large gaps with a soilless mixture. If there's nothing in the soil, and again, make sure that you check the bags that you're using, or if you make your own, you'll obviously know, um, if you need to put fertilizer in it or not. And then water well or remove small pockets. Every time I build the pot and water it, it sinks a little bit. I might have to add a little more dirt in one area or the other so that the roots aren't exposed. And then, of course, you know, enjoy it. Um, there are a lot of other small space gardening options, which there's just so many that it's, it'd be hard to go into um, in, in this, this type of environment. But up against a fence, cucumbers uh, growing up. I have a friend who lives in, uh, in Old Town Manassas doesn't have a lot of space, but has a fence. And actually, we're gonna build a little a little um, fence like this for her, and she's gonna grow cucumbers right up it. It takes zero space, essentially, to grow something like that. I've also, on decks, grown cucumbers in pots and had them grow up trellises. It worked extremely well. Again, you can see some, some look like um, beans down here on the, the bottom left. Um, I, th I thought this one was very ingenious on the, in the uh, middle on the bottom with the, with the tubs and growing along the side of their house like that. Um, raised beds are another option that you can do. Um, I actually have raised beds in my garden garden because it's actually a very, very wet area and it tends to uh, not do so, a lot of the plants don't do so well in the springtime. But um, that's just another option for you. So I, I think that's my last one. I hope I've given you some uh, some good ideas on uh, container gardening and how to set up your, your containers. And uh, I hope you enjoyed my very rapid um, speech. That's great. Nancy, uh, this one's for you. Um, we have a few questions that um, I think you'd answer better than I did. Um, let's see. What, what combinations of vegetables and flowers do you, have you found um, to be a good combination. Um, in, just in the basket, I'm, I've grown small sized basils with, with patio tomatoes. Probably mm -hmm. one of my favorite ones to grow together with tomatoes. 
and then I'll just pick a leaf and pick a tomato at the same time. Uh, it's really good. Since they're not sprayed with anything, you can just pop them right in your mouth out there. It's, it's delicious. Um, I've tended to grow, uh, to tell you the truth, a lot of the flowers that I grow, I have tended to grow as single species. There's several pots that I mix together that, um, that have done quite well um, outside. Uh, one of my biggest gardening mistakes was planting Creeping Jenny. And <laughs> Creeping Jenny does more than creep. It just takes over. I'm still pulling it out of the garden. And actually, I'll use it in my pots now because I still find it all over the place. And I'll put it around the edges, Creeping Jenny, let it flow down, and um, put something taller to start seeing a spike or something in the center with uh, – uh, What's the one that, that we like to use so much? Oh, geraniums around it. Those are beautiful baskets that really survive the heat well and, and look really nice um, almost the whole time. Those are some of my favorites, but um, I probably have to say overall, I really, really like putting perennials in. That's one of my favorite things to do. I'll buy them during the course of the year. I'll, I have different areas where I'm building new gardens where things have cycled through, and I'll decide what I want to put out there. So the, there's a question here about um, a trellis and supports. There are some neat fasteners that you can purchase online. And we don't, we can't recommend a product, um, but I, I use small bamboo that was dried and, and connected them together to make a little trellis or oh, yeah. TP, TP like arrangement. Um, and there, some of the bigger trellises that are available, they're miniature sizes of those. Um, and I have like passion flower vine growing up those. Mm -hmm. So actually some of the um, better garden centers have, have a, quite a variety of interesting trellises. But you, you can also just use um, sticks from your yard, making a rustic type uh, of trellis, uh, lashing it together with uh, leather or twine. Um, Jeff, we have a couple other questions here. Um, <laughs> Can you share your wildlife adventures? Um, which ones? <laughs> how about the, the um, just how you keep uh, animals out of the containers? Uh, animals in containers are hard. I, I was actually telling Nancy earlier that one thing I did find that works, and it may not work for everybody, and this is not a, a proper extension verified thing, but most animals, especially squirrels, don't like strong smells. I, I, and uh, I've tried just grinding up garlic and putting it around my tomatoes, and that has actually helped keep them away. Now, it's something you have to, to do, you know, fairly periodically, but uh, that has helped. My garden garden has um, mesh around it, and my containers that I keep out by the garden are all off the ground up in the air so that bunnies and other things can't easily get to them. Um, but we've had just about everything in, in our containers before. I was watering a plant that was on my uh, deck, and out pops a black snake looking right at me. <laughs> That's probably the worst encounter I've ever had with one. Fairly innocuous, but it scared me so bad. Uh, I think that the dog ran over, and she's barking, and the snake's climbing up the trellis. But, uh, yeah, it's hard sometimes with, with uh, especially the squirrels seem to like to dig in some of the containers. Okay, and I'm going to stop it there. Um, my video s still doesn't seem to be working, but oh well. Um, I I thought the um, grinded up garlic method to deter pests was really interesting, and so that's why um, I wanted you guys to, to you know hear it too, just in case you do have pest problems um while you do your container gardenings um so th thank you everyone for coming to the gardening workshop again um i hope you guys have learned um something um so if anyone has any questions um feel free to ask them now if anyone has any comments feel free to ask them now or say them now. Um, if we, if you do have any questions that we can't ask, it that we can't answer, um, you can always contact the Manassas 
um, the Master Gardener's Horticultural Help Desk. Um, the email is um, up on screen right now. And so, yeah.